It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. Just the other day, I found a thread that's probably the worst kind of thread imaginable on Twitter, giving out some really bad advice on how to write characters. This Twitter user goes by the name of Lily Ocard. She has she and her pronouns. I yell about cartoons for a living. Get pedophiles and fascists out of children's media 2021. I actually agree with her idea about saying the pedophiles and the fascists somewhere else because without the pedophiles and the fascists, the world would actually be a better place to live in. But without further hesitation, let's read a thread. Don't worry about spoilers. If your story is good, spoilers are not going to make it any less enjoyable. If spoilers make a story less enjoyable, that means you are relying on cheap shock value as a shortcut. I'm not sure about spoilers because there are some people who like spoilers, there are some who don't like spoilers, so it kind of depends on the person. And honestly, as a writer, if someone wants to spoil my story, I would personally be upset because I work hard for it not to, you know, be ruined. And so it kind of depends on the person and the attitude, so I guess I'm not going to knock this comment off. The middle part of a story is the best time to get a main couple together. Are you working on a season 5 show? Put your main couple together halfway through season 3. The finale is the worst time because we don't get to see any time they enjoy the payoff. I guess it depends on the person. I'm not going to respond to this comment either because, again, it kind of depends on the context of the story and so on, so I'll give that comment a pass too. Friends to lovers, enemies to lovers, anytime. I'm not sure about that because it's interesting to see how characters evolve as enemies. They fight against each other, they have competitions and stuff. I think that makes more of an interesting character development than have somebody to just be their friend and later become, you know, somebody's couple. So I think it's much more interesting to see a, a dynamic against like enemies becoming friends and so on. But that's just me. Victims of abuse moving away from the negative impacts of their abuse and becoming healthier are not redemption arcs. Literally your example was a redemption arc. So, how could you say that redemption arcs don't exist when you literally just gave an example of one? Heroes refusing to kill villains who have shown to be actively trying to murder people isn't noble, it's enabling. I guess it kind of depends on the aim of the story. Like, is the aim of the story to be complicated or, you know, move away from tradition? Because I think it all depends on the aim of the author and what's the goal for the character to do that. So, it kind of depends on the aim on what you're trying to do for the story. Two women kissing at the last episode of a show after four or five seasons of trying to murder each other is a revolutionary, is fetishized abuse and violence. Again, it kind of depends on the story you want to tell. Like, if it's just a story about, of course, friends becoming like, you know, um, friend, like a couple, then obviously it's not going to be as, you know, dramatic. But when a villain and enemies become like friends, of course, naturally going back and forth is interesting character progression. It goes back to your previous point about, of course, friends becoming, you know, a couple and villains becoming friends. I think it's much more interesting to see that as an audience member. Twitter is not an appropriate place to reveal story details. The appropriate place is in the work itself. I actually agree with that. When a character body counts over 10,000 innocent lives, then that character is no longer redeemable. I mean, again, it kind of depends on the story. Is the story about a villain? Is it about a villain having some sort of redeemable act? Because it all depends on the story that you're talking about. Everything in the story is there because the creator wished it to be there. Trying to explain bigger than story decisions using world building is a fallacy because you put it there to begin with. I'm not sure about that because like when you make art, there are some people who might interpret the art differently than how you initially trying to make it. 
And so what you put in your book or your film or your music might be different than what the people actually interpret it to be. There are many interviews of people and artists saying the exact same thing that I'm saying right now. And so largely it depends upon the perception of the person to interpret the art a certain way. Don't pair minors with adults. That's pedophilia. Well, I actually do have a fuck agree. However, it kind of depends on the setting. Like, obviously, it's awful. I'm not going to excuse it at all. But what if the story is like in medieval times? Like, wouldn't it make sense for people in medieval times to have some sort of pedophilia going on? Don't sexualize teenage characters. Okay, fair enough. That's true. We should not sexualize teenage characters. Making a metaphor for gay trans ace representation is always inferior to just making a gay trans ace character. Again, it kind of depends on the story. Do you want to make a story with gay characters or something different? It all depends on the context of what kind of story you want to tell. If there are humans in your stories, restricting gay trans ace representation to non-human characters make you a huge turd. If the only gay man in your work is a diva, you're a huge turd. If the only lesbian in your work is an abusive rapeholic with rage, anger issues, and a codependent relationship to a protagonist, you're a huge turd. If your only non-binary character is a non-human shapeshifter, you're a huge turd. If your only black character is a hyper angry butte, you're a huge turd. If the only black woman in your cast barely gets any screen time except to be fetishized or fit rule 20, you're a huge turd. If the only trans woman in your cast is a drag queen by all in name, you're a huge turd. If you force a woman to kiss her abuser, you're a huge turd. If you sideline every non-white character in your cast to focus on a white boy with anger issues and tendency towards hostility getting a redemption act, you're a huge turd. So basically, any type of stuff that goes against your less make you a huge turd. How in the world is this advice at all? This is not advice. All this kind of stuff you just say right now is just opinion based, based upon your standard for storytelling. Whereas, I don't think that's actually just black and white. Like, it's not make you a huge turd to make you have these sort of stereotypes or whatever. Like, there are, of course, characters who are complex or sometimes fit a certain mold. It kind of depends on the context of the author and what they're trying to portray. It does not make you a huge turd to actually feature some sort of emotions for characters or be a certain way. So, how is this some sort of, you know, good advice for anybody at all? Justifying horny armor designs or horny clothing designs with sexual agency makes you a huge turd. Characters do not have sexual agency. You just make them that way as a justification. See rule 10. Are we really going to go back to that argument about the armor design? Because you see, if women have, of course, like the armor for men, obviously the chest is going to be like really painful when you put on that armor. However, with the armor design for women, they're not going to feel any type of pain. It's not about, of course, making a character look sexy. It actually, you know, fits the armor for women to actually feel comfortable. Now, as far as like sexualizing women and, of course, portraying them as sexy, I don't see what's like the big deal with that. Like, if women actually have sexual agency over their body, should it not, not be portrayed in media too? Like, what is so wrong with wanting to have sexy characters? Like, we see all these men with these big muscles and stuff in the stories when they're playing as the hero, yet there is like nobody actually complaining about that. Right? But for some strange reason, if you try to sexualize women in the same sort of light like men, people would just freak the hell out. Like, I don't understand this kind of line of reasoning. Like, how is it okay to sexualize men, to give them big muscles, but it's not okay to do that for women? It does not make any sense to me. Related to the above, if your justification is to be honest and say like sexy characters, you're still a huge turd, but slightly less of a turd than the above. Don't worry about having everything planned out beforehand. No writer or creator plans everything beforehand, and the ones who said they are are filthy liars. Writers have the best one or two story beats to determine to include. Everything else is by the seat of their pants. 
I mean, it kind of depends on the writer. There are some writers who do, in fact, have nothing planned out. And then there are some writers who need a timeline to write everything out. So it kind of largely depends on the person. Don't try and do what Avatar did. You can't. Even the people who made Avatar can't make another show do what Avatar did. Oh, that's a nice burn. That's actually a really funny burn right there. Low stakes interpersonal conflict will only be more satisfying in the long run than the high stakes saving the world. France is more popular than your average anime for a reason. I'm not sure about that. I have a general feeling that Dragon Ball might be more popular than Friends, but um, who knows? Choose whether you're writing a comedy or a drama at the start and just stick to it. Do not make a comedy, then turn into a drama later on that just annoys people. I mean, it kind of depends on your intentions. Like, there are movies like Evil Dead. It, tar it like started out really seriously towards the beginning of the first movie, right? But by the second movie, it became a horror comedy. And by the third movie, it was just comedy. And it actually worked in all three movies. And so, to merge ideas from one genre to the other is actually not anything new. So I think those kind of movies are interesting hybrids for people to actually express themselves. World building is like salt. A pinch make it better, ten cups of it will not. <laughs> oh man, I'm not sure how to feel about that. Characters should always come before anything else. I actually agree. The protagonist should be the protagonist, not a vessel for the antagonist to hog the story. If you're gonna make a villain a protagonist, just be open with it. Again, it makes characters more interesting for development by turning them from bad to good or good to bad. Like, that's like story 101. Like, people are more interested to see, like, characters develop to something, to something that they're not. That's basically how you get people to see your story or your film or whatever. Perspectives shift are a staple of storytelling. Having one perspective isn't a stylistic choice, it's just crap. Again, it depends on the content creator. There are characters that are written in first person point of views. There are some stories that are written in second point of view or like in third points of view. So yes, it actually is a stylistic choice to have it in first, second, or third person's point of view. If you're making a cartoon, hire writers, don't just have your storyboarders write the story. That's not what they're there for. Artists draw, writers write. Artists cannot just take over for the writers on a run. Dude, people are multi-talented, man. Like there are some writers who are directors. There are some directors who are producers. There are cameramen who are directors. There are like basically, there are some people who are so multi-talented that you can actually do every single thing at once or sometimes. Like it depends on the person. Now obviously, myself, I'm good at editing, I'm good at like writing, I'm good at directing. And so I'm pretty multi-talented behind the camera when it comes to this kind of stuff. However, like there are people like Robert Rodriguez, he's like a writer, he's like a director, he is like some sort of composer. He does like a lot of stuff for his productions, right, for special effects. So people can be multi-talented for film productions. To say that a writer cannot be a storyboarder or that a storyboarder can't be a writer, that's just ludicrous to me. This is the first 30 tweets of this person. Of course, I'll pick up later on in the video for the next part, but it's like so bad so far. Like it actually get worse from here on out because this is not the worst part of the tweet thread that I've seen. But what do you guys think so far? Tell me in the comment section down below, and I'll talk to you guys next time.
It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. 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 It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.